Okay, so I think it's time for the last session. Um, here we will present open problems and I propose to make this session uh, kind of less formal, meaning that uh, um, feel free to turn on your camera whenever you want or uh, be more open about asking questions. Um, okay, so the uh, schedule of the session is that uh, we will have some, I don't remember, like five or six, I think, uh, open problems. Uh, for each of them, well, we plan to have five minutes, but since we have more time, I think six, seven minutes is okay. And if anyone like has a last minute open problem, then it's okay to do it at the end. And I think the first uh, open problems uh, mm, will be presented by Tony. Uh, I hope he's here. Okay, I am here, but I don't know whether you can hear me. Philip, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I'm ready to start. If I, if you give me the green light, I can start. I, I would give like the to. Green light. Okay, thanks a lot. So I would like to share my slides with you. So I hope I managed to do that because that's actually easier for me to present using the slides. So can you see the slides now? Uh, no. Not yet. No. So let me try to push the button. So how about now? Yeah. So can you, okay, so you see the slides say an open problem and so on, okay? Mm -hmm. so, so I can start. So the, the problem I'm going to talk about is related to deciding polynomial termination complexity in uh, vast games. So I need to explain what I mean by uh, termination complexity. This is the only notion which I need to, to explain the problem. So when I'm done with that, I will also tell you what is known about this uh, termination complexity analysis uh, in, in a VAS, uh, uh, in particular in VAS games. And then I will revisit the problem again, and then this time I will be able to discuss more details. So, okay, so a VAS is a VAS, so everybody knows what that is. So the standard thing, we have control states, transitions, counter updates, and I assume, I mean, on all the complexity results, I'm going to talk about assume that the counter updates are encoded in binary. Okay, so let us assume that the set of control states is split into two disjoint subsets of uh, angelic and uh, demonic control states. So these are controlled by two players, demon and angel. And the idea is that the demon is a player who wants to prolong the computation of a given VAS while the angel aims at shortening this computation. So we assume we start in some initial configuration, PV, and then the two players determine the computation of the VAS in the usual way. So again, the demon aims at prolonging the computation, angel aims at shortening the computation. The computation stops when the sum of the counters becomes negative. Okay. So uh, this is actually a kind of VAS uh, games where the two players have opposite objectives. And these uh, games are determined, which means that the usual soup inf inequality holds. So this equality also defines for every initial configuration the termination value. So, so ideally, uh, so, so, sorry, so intuitively this termination value of a given configuration is, is the length of the computation obtained uh, when the computation is initiated in PV and both players play optimally. <clears throat> so now we can define the termination complexity of a given VAS. This is a function which to every integer assigns uh, another number, which can also be infinite. And uh, this number is the maximum of all termination values of all configurations where the initial counter values are bounded by, by n. And now the problems I am presenting is the following. So for a given VAS game, we want to know whether the termination complexity is asymptotically bounded by a polynomial of a given degree k. So this is the problem. So now I think this is a good checkpoint. So if anybody has a question, it's good. I do. Can you please repeat? Uh, can you please re-describe T-Val? T-Val, okay. So, so 
I believe that they understand that the computation starts in the configuration PV. So this is the co initial control state. This is the initial counter values. And now the computation is determined by the two players, the demon and the angel. The demon wants to make the computation long. The angel wants to make it short. So both of them make moves, and thus they determine a single path in this in this bus, a single computation. And uh, this proceeds as long as all counters are positive. As soon as one of them becomes negative, then the play is over, that the computation is, is terminated. And now what is the T-Val? Well, this is the length of the path initiated in PV obtained under the assumption that both players play optimally. So for a given configuration PV, this can be like 20, meaning that if both players play optimally, they produce a computation of length 20. In principle, this T-Val can also be infinite because it may happen that the angel cannot prevent the demon for, from producing an infinite path. So in general, this T-Val can also be infinite. Is it Great. better? Yes, much. OK. So any, any other question? OK, so if not, then I can uh, go on and uh, I explain what is known about the problem. And I will revisit the problem at the end again. And this time I will be able to tell you more details about, about uh, the ways how this question can be approached. So <clears throat> the existing results about, uh, uh, about uh, termination complexity uh, mostly consider just demoning VAS. So these are VAS, VAS where there is only one player, the demon who wants to prolong the computation. And the results are mostly encouraging because many interesting questions can be decided in polynomial time. So for example, the problem whether the termination complexity of a given demonic VAS is linear is decidable in polynomial time. We can also ask whether the termination complexity is polynomial, that is whether it is bounded by a polynomial of some finite degree. And again, this question is decidable in polynomial time. And very recently, it has been shown that uh, for every fixed k, the question of whether the termination complexity is bounded, asymptotically bounded by a polynomial of the degree k, is also decidable in polynomial time. So this is almost the same problem I consider in here, only that this holds only for demonic class. So my open problems is uh, the same question formulated for general VASP games. There is also a related result about a slightly different model about VAS MDPs. And the result says that, again, the linearity of the termination uh, complexity is decidable in, uh, in polynomial time. And there is also a recent result presented at uh, Leaks this year. And in order to formulate it, I unfortunately need one more notion, but it pays because I will be able to uh, say something more about these past games in the end. So I need to define the following hierarchy of fast growing functions in the following way. So the first levels are defined as follows. So the first function is the linear function. The second one is the quadratic function. The third one is the single exponential function. And the next function in the hierarchy is then obtained as uh, you know composing the previous function n times and applying the composition to the end. So this is almost the standard hierarchy of fast growing function, except that the first levels in our hierarchy are defined somewhat differently so that it better suits our needs. And furthermore, we define the class GK for every K. The, the, the G states, uh, stands for Xekorczyk. And this GK is the class of all functions which are bounded by some finite composition of these F k function. So this mu must be some constant. So for example, if you look at this, then what is this g1? These are functions which are bounded by a finite composition of f1. Of course, if you compose linear functions constantly many times, you just obtain a linear function. So this g1 it contains all linear functions. If you do the same with f2, well, if you compose the quadratic functions constantly many times, you obtain a function which is a polynomial of some finite degree. So this g2 contains all polynomial functions. This g3 contains all elementary functions, and so on. And the recent result says that, uh, OK, if you fix a k and you ask whether the termination complexity of a given demonic was goes to this gk class, then this is also decidable in polynomial time. But we also have a result for games, which says that for games, the same problem is actually NP-complete. 
And now, if we come back to our problem, then by applying this result, we see that, OK, so now we are given a bus and some k, and we want to know whether the termination complexity of a given bus game is bounded by a polynomial of the degree k. So for k equals to 1, that is for linear uh, functions, this problem is simply complete. This follows just by applying uh, this uh, uh, general result for k equal to 1. But interestingly, I mean, for a uh, larger case, this is uh, open. This doesn't follow from the, from, from the, the, the results I just mentioned. And actually, one can show that for every k, which is at least 2, this problem is p space hard, which also indicates that the technique, the proof technique, which was used to obtain this result, is is not applicable. So one has, one has to devise something something new, some some other technique. Intuitively, here we rely on the fact that this GK class is closed on the function composition. And now, if you take, uh, I don't know the the the, the, for k equal to 2, you obtain a quadratic function. So, of course, if you compose uh, two quadratic functions, you do not obtain a quadratic function. So, this crucial assumption, which is behind this result, is no longer true. So, so this is all we know at the moment that the problem is p space hard. I do not know how to derive the decidability. So, let's see. I mean, I plan to work on this problem. So, if anybody gets hooked and uh, is interested in cooperating with me, you are most welcome to write me an email. We can uh, arrange some meeting and uh, work together. Thanks a lot. That's it. Thanks, Tony. Um, are there any comments or questions? Um, I guess not. So thanks again. So I stop sharing my screen, OK? Yes. Okay. And uh, now I think uh, we want uh, Gijarma to I'm here. All right. Let me see if I can share my screen. I think it's shared. Is it? Yes. All right. Uh, so this will be short. Um, I have two problems, and this is related to some work we got accepted with uh, with um, people from Oxford. Um, to concur this year. So the two problems are related to the to sort of uh, a weaker model of, um, than the one I, I presented uh, problems on today. And so if you skip that or you stop paying attention because you're bored with my voice, I'm going to do it again. Uh, the model is as follows. We have uh, states. We have an initial state. We have an accepting state like this one. We have transitions, the arrows, and on these transitions, you have uh, updates like plus 5, plus x1, minus x2. And um, so this uh, x things corresponds to a set of variables. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, so the main difference with what I presented today is that there are no equivalence tests. But uh, I'm going to add this uh, disequality test on, on states. So you, you're allowed, uh, this is a one counter net with disequality tests, essentially. And uh, it's a parametric one counter net. Um, so the, the questions I'm interested in, unless anyone has a question about uh, the model. So it's essentially a one counter net in which you have parameters in the updates. And uh, I block some of the values of the counter in uh, for every state I can block a set of values which uh, which you cannot use. So that's the model. And for the problems, there's three problems that uh, I consider interesting. The first one is control state reachability or just plain coverability. This is actually known to be in polynomial time. This is the result we got published this year in Concur. And the, the other two questions, the ones that are actually open, is uh, what happens if you ask for configuration reachability and not for uh, coverability? I, I don't know what the complexity for that is, although I, I do know that this is definitely NP hard and that uh, it should be in P space. By, and uh, here, 
I should have mentioned this earlier, I'm focusing on non-parametric. So the set of parameters is empty. It's a, it's a one counter net with, a, with blocked configurations in some states. So I, uh, the, the complexity is in P space, it's MP heart. I would like to know what's the, what's the exact complexity of this thing. And then coming back to my obsession with parameters, um, I would like to know whether um, it is decidable to ask a duster exist evaluation for the parameters such that you can reach the uh, accepting state. So I, I don't care about the, the value. Uh, and this, I don't even know if it's decidable. So extremely open. So that's it. This is problem one and problem two for me. And uh, yeah, I, I think I've thought about this thing for over, an, over a year and made no progress. So if anyone has any ideas, I'd be happy to hear about it. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Guillermo. Um, thanks for encouraging everyone at the end. Um, so I don't see any questions. Any, does anyone want to ask something? Okay, uh, I don't think well, I so. want to ask. So what are, um, so NP hardness and P space easiness, I would say. Which one is hard? Which one is complicated? Which one is easy? And what are the techniques? You, you mean how, how the uh, known bounds are obtained? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the NP hardness, it's because um, even without the disequality tests, if you take a one counter net, then reachability is known to be NP hard. So that's, uh, yeah, it's a dumb NP hardness. And for P space membership, you can uh, get rid of the disequality tests by considering upper and lower bounds. So you can reduce this to one counter automata in which you bounded one counter automata in which you have an upper and a lower bound. Mm -hmm. and this is, I believe, uh, Marcin Schutzinski's free. Mm -hmm. So that's that's P space membership. But th this problem is somewhere in the middle, and no idea. Could be in P space complete. I don't know. Okay, thanks. All right, thanks, Guillermo again, Guillermo. Um... <laughs> So now I think uh, Georg also wanted to present something. Uh, hi, uh, I was, uh, let me see if I can switch on the camera. Hi, I was under the impression that I'm after um, uh, Wojtek, but I can do it now. Oh, okay. So also my impression. Yeah, uh, yeah I messed up. So maybe, uh, actually, maybe it makes more sense if I start because uh, I'm, I talk about the more general problem and then maybe Wojtek, you can say uh, why the special case. Uh, is, is interesting. Okay, sure. Okay, sorry about okay. that. I... No problem. So let me see if I can share my screen. I've never tried this. Can you see? Yeah. Okay. When I when I draw here, everyone can see. I can see. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so my problem is um, regular separability in vector addition systems. So uh, you all know what, what a vector addition system is. And uh, it's a very classical notion to assign uh, a language to a vector addition system. So if you have a vector addition system like this, let's say this is a state, and then uh, you have edges that are labeled by letters and vectors. Uh, I don't know, let's say like this. And then you have a, a final state like this, QF maybe. Okay, I don't know what this thing does, but um, okay, you can imagine you have edges with vectors on them um, and letters. So this is supposed to be a C. And then the language accepted is the set of all words over the uh, labeling alphabet so that if you start in the initial configuration uh, with all zero uh, coordinates, taking a path that is labeled by that word brings you to the final state and again with uh, zero coordinates. So that's a vector addition system language. And 
So let's say L of V. And uh, I would say a lot of things are known about them. So uh, for example, uh, a, lot of, a lot is known about um, uh, if, if there exist certain words of certain shapes. And that's essentially because you can intersect those languages with other vector addition system languages and then check for emptiness. That's a very powerful tool. Um, but recently, uh, people have become interested in separability problems. And I think these are very interesting because they force us to understand vector addition system languages um, in much more detail uh, in order to uh, decide these problems. So the separability problem is in general, you have a uh, class S of separators. So that's a class of language. And then typically the question, the separability problem is given L1 and L2, uh, does there exist a separating language from that class of separators uh, so that L1 is contained in S and L2 is uh, disjoint from S? So I hope I can move this thing. Yes, okay. So now the regular separability problem is given vast languages L1 and L2. And the question is, does there exist a regular separator? So that uh, L1 is contained in R and L2 is disjoint from R. And so to decide this, you essentially have to decide if there are uh, pairs of words, one word in L1, one, L, one word in L2, so that they're um, more and more similar and they get, uh, and more and more similar means harder and harder to distinguish by a finite state automaton. So instead of deciding if a language contains a word of a certain shape, we now have to decide if um, there are uh, sequences of words that, that approach each other. So that's a very different type of problem. And we have to understand the structure of vast languages um, uh, much better to decide them. Um, the, and in fact, there are several uh, partial results that have already um, yielded interesting uh, facts about uh, the structure of vast languages. So let me just uh, say briefly what is known. Um, so in fact, what is known are always cases where one input language is a general vast language and the other comes from a subclass. So we know the following cases are decidable. Uh, you have on the one hand, you have a vast language. And on the other hand, you have a, one option is you have a coverability language. So that's a vast language where the where here in the uh, in the final configuration it doesn't have to be zero but it can be any configuration. Uh, not sure I can. Ah, no, I'm out of space. Um, okay, so the other option is uh, it can be a one vast language. So you so the vast has only one uh, counter. Uh, or it can be a Z vast, which means it's syntactically the same, but you, you already accept a word if on the way it, the counters go negative, but they have to be zero in the end. Um, and I believe, oh, and there's one other case. Um, let's write that over here. It's a commutative mass versus commutative mass. So commutative means the languages happen to be commutative. So if you accept one word, you accept all permutations of that word. If you know that about a language, of, uh, about a vast language, then you can, uh, about two input languages, then you can decide separately. So these results have uh, appeared uh, this year in leaks. And this is 
the stacks. Ah, what is happening? Uh, 17. Um, yeah, I should say I have only been involved in the in the leaks one, not in the stacks one. Uh, yeah, let's. Yeah, I should mention who the authors are. So this was, and Wojtek can uh, correct me. So this was uh, Clement uh, Chavinsky and Lazota. I'm not sure if there was anyone else on that paper, Wojtek? There was Charles Papermann as well. Oh yeah, that's right. Ah, yes, Papermann. Sorry, it's the wrong order. That was this paper, and this is uh, Chavinsky and someone else. <laughs> yeah, so that's all that's known. Um, it seems to be very difficult, and uh, I don't think we're close to solving it, but we have made significant, uh, well, uh, there have, has been significant progress. Um, yeah, it seems to be very challenging. And um, yeah, that's it for my side. Thanks. Thanks, Georg. Um, are there any questions? I have a, I have a question. So do you, do you allow for epsilon transitions in, in the bus? Uh, we do, but I, I don't think that makes a difference. Uh, okay. I, yes, I think... Yes, if you... You can assume there are no epsilon transitions. If you can decide it without, then you can already decide it in the general case. Okay. You can essentially just replace all the epsilon. Ah, although, I'm not entirely sure, but I, I, I believe this makes no difference. I'd have to think about the reason again. But uh, yeah, I think it makes no difference. OK, thanks. Uh, thanks, Georg, again. Uh, now I guess it's Wojtek's turn. Uh, who, who was this question from about the epsilon transitions? I uh, it was me, uh, Tony Kuchera, yeah. Ah, I see, okay, thank you. Because I, I have this web client where I don't see who's talking and so on, so thank you. I only see Philip right now, <laughs> thanks. Okay, um, so I can continue now. Um, could you, girl, could you stop sharing? Because oh yeah, sorry. Um, I think that after, uh, okay, so my problem also concerns regular separability, but after what Georg just said and what um, Radek said, I don't need any slides. Um, so I just want to um, tell about one particular case of um, regular separability. So of course, the main, the big goal is to understand uh, how, what about, um, regular separability on general vector addition system languages, but, but as Georg mentioned, this seems to be very challenging uh, and this needs uh, much more understanding of vast languages than we have now. But uh, we, oh, okay, so, um, but, so we know the solution for one dimensional uh, vast languages, one counter net languages, but we don't know the solution for two dimensional vast languages. And this, so like, you know, there is a feeling that uh, one dimensional and two dimensional buses are simpler than more dimensional buses. So I think this is a, um, this is a nice open problem. What with two dimensional uh, buses? And so why we can think that it's simpler than the general setting. So uh, beside this, this known results that, for example, bus reachabil uh, reachability, relational reachability set is semi-linear semi -linear in two buses. So, um, well, okay, I'm not sure whether this is simpler, but uh, the solution of regular separability in one dimensional buses, it somehow uses pumping in one counters. And, uh, and uh, that was one of the motivations, actually the very original motivation to, to consider, um, to start the work which Radek was uh, explaining. And now we have at hand a tool for pumping runs which are two dimensional. And it seems we are kind of close to, um, to, um, 
to solve this um, two-dimensional reachability, but um, very intuitively, if you have, uh, let's say, separability of, of uh, two systems, it's a bit similar to empty, emptiness of intersection of this uh, of these two systems of course it's 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 not a direct uh, connection but you can think like mm, it's a similar problem so in a sense mm, regular separability for one dimensional systems it is a bit similar to emptiness for one one bus times one bus so two bus System and now regular separability uh, for two bus systems is a bit similar to product of two two two-dimensional buses. So then it's it's somehow we need the knowledge about four-dimensional buses, and of course we can decide uh, emptiness for four-dimensional buses, but we we don't know how to decide something similar to emptiness for four-dimensional buses, but. Okay, so what I just wanted to say, I wanted to advertise that problem. I think we are, it's not hopeless, we are not hopeless. And um, and I think it's a nice direction. That's all I wanted to say. Questions? Thanks, Vitek. I have a question. Uh, are all of these, are all of these um, just decidability questions for, for your problem and for the previous one? Mm, oh, well, I just I just somehow mentioned uh, decidability, but it, that's not true. For example, for uh, regular separability of one-dimensional buses, we ha we have uh, p-space completeness, so it it can be much uh, much better than mm, and decidability. But for two-dimensional buses, I mean. I can imagine that you can reduce to something similar to uh, reachability for four-dimensional buses, and for that one, we currently don't have anything better than you know hyper non-elementary things. But maybe in some future we will get something elementary. Who knows? So yeah, it's not only we are not only interested in uh, inside the bit. But this okay. is first one, first question which we can ask. Okay. Um, thanks, Rana. Thanks, Vitek. Are there any more questions? Um, all right. Uh, so, okay. Apologies for this question, but is there anyone I forgot about? Um, okay, so, no. I'm not sure, Philip. We were discussing some potential open problem regarding tower lower bound for some subclass. Or, or some, I don't know. I wanted to population protocols. Oh, I, I don't know how to present that, but I wanted to present like a very simple question. Uh, so I'll, if no one wants to present anything else, then I'll just do that. Um, if I share a whiteboard, does this work? Um, do you see this? Yes, we see. Okay, uh, Vitek, you will have to control the time for me. Um, so here's the problem. No, that's not how do you. Um, so imagine, so this is for those that know me, know that it's a problem that I'm obsessed with for some time. Um, but I think it's actually important. Um, imagine, so. For those that know, it's imagine a flat bus, but actually imagine something much more simpler. You have a vector addition system where essentially your states are ordered like this. You have just one counter uh, and you, uh, you have two types of transitions. Either you loop in the state, like plus five, or you move to the next one, okay? And now I'm asking about uh, reachability. So let's say you start with value, you have just one counter. You start with value zero and you ask whether you can reach value zero. Um, 
so this uh, problem is uh, and everything is encoded in unary so unary um, one bus and actually not, not it's not only bus it's like a very simple bus you have a path with this property that you have these two types of transitions you either move right or you look in the state now without of this restriction it's known that this reachability i mean by this restriction i mean that it's a normal one vector addition one dimensional vector addition system in unary it's known that uh, already then it's known to be in non-deterministic log space because you can prove that if there is a witness then the value of the counter there is also a witness such that the value of the counter does not go above some threshold now for this restriction um, it's not known uh, if you can do better then there is no non-deterministic log space uh, lower bound so let me try to tell you why I think this problem is very interesting. Um, so one reason is that if you actually, if you have two counters, uh, then uh, you can prove that there is a non-deterministic logarithmic uh, log, log space lower bound. But uh, if you have just one counter, then you cannot. And I think, I claim you can do better. And maybe you can prove that it's, so the, the open problem is whether this is, for example, in log space. Um, and one reason why I find this problem very interesting is uh, that there is a problem which seems it's kind of related, namely uh, there is the problem of the, the subset sum problem. Uh, this problem is like a typical NP-complete problem when you encode it in binary, but in unary it's known to be in polynomial time. And actually, it's uh, moreover it's known that you can it's uh, in the logarithmic space, uh, deterministic log space. And if you Google uh, unary subset sum, it's a paper on archive. It has like six pages, and it's one of the nicest paper I read. And the reason why this problem is connected to this is that uh, you can think that subset sum is like, you know, you're, you can, you can put your target value, like say, I don't know, like the, the, this number n, and here you have, you have, you can have many loops. Uh, that will subtract this value so here like this is in the same state because in subset sum the order doesn't matter but here like you put them in some artificial order and the second difference is that uh, um, here it's not exactly subset sum it's like multi subset sum uh, you because you can you allow to take each uh, of the transition many times and this simplified version, uh, as I said, it's in logarithmic space, in deterministic log space. But this, when you have this order, and while well, the loops can be both positive and negative, I, I don't know. Uh, so yeah, the question is whether this very simple VAS, uh, can, it be, can we do reachability better than non-deterministic log space? That's it. Uh, are there any questions? I can stop sharing then. Uh, what could be better than non-deterministic log space? Log space. That is deterministic. Um, all right. Uh, so if there are no more questions, I will just close the workshop. Um, so. I want to well, I want to thank all the speakers for doing a really great job. Um, I think the talks were quite good. I mean, they were good. Um, I want to thank uh, everyone for participating. Um, 
Um, I want to thank Maximilian, who is responsible for the technical details of the workshop. I think he's doing a good job. Everything was running smoothly. Um, I don't remember, was I supposed to say anything else? Wojtek, do you have anything to add? Maybe we can say that we will um, put the um, recordings on, the, on YouTube I will, and maybe we will Mm, maybe you can ask speakers for slides and, and yes we will yes. probably put something more on our website just for future yes and otherwise i think that's it unless there are any questions um so to answer ranka's question yes i'm going for beer um <laughs> you're welcome to join Okay, so maybe I could say something. So uh, I am an informal steering committee chair of Infinity. So as a steering committee chair, let me thank both both of you for organizing this event, even under these difficult circumstances. According to everything I saw, this was a, this was a success. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Tony. Okay. Thanks for letting us organize it. All right, uh, so I guess we can conclude. Uh, see you, I hope, in real life at some point. Bye-bye. <laughs>